The global warming challenge uh, is really three interlocking challenges, and to make matters worse, we're going to have to solve them all three simultaneously. The first is that we don't supply nearly enough energy globally, and we really don't supply it broadly enough. There's huge energy inequality. The second is that to stabilize uh, the climate system at any level is going to require reaching net zero greenhouse gas emissions. And the third is that we're going to have to figure out how to adapt to what is rapidly becoming a very extreme climate. So what's the evidence for these three assertions? Uh, first, energy poverty. There's just massive energy poverty globally, uh, a billion people without access to electricity, and even more without access to the benefits of modern energy resources. And this is a huge barrier to human development. The photo here uh, is over a decade old, but uh, here at a, at a university really crystallizes the challenge. These are college students in the Republic of Guinea. They don't have electricity in their homes. They migrate daily to the airport and, and sit under the lights uh, on the road leading up to the airport. If we look globally, we can see the disparity. Here in the US, we use about 10 times as much energy per capita as in India. If we compare uh, the US to uh, Japan, which is uh, one of the most energy efficient countries in the OECD, or the, the uh, economically wealthy, uh, high human well-being uh, countries, we use about twice as much per capita here in the US as in Japan. So what does this imply for the amount of energy that we're going to need globally, particularly given that we're on track for a world of 10 billion people uh, in the mid-century? Well, we can answer this question a few different ways. One is we can just ask if we take the current average and multiply by 10 billion. That's a 25% increase compared to the total energy today. If we take the US government's uh, assumption uh, about uh, the middle of the century, that's about a 50% increase relative today. But that still assumes continued inequality in energy access. If we want to go to the extreme and imagine a world of 10 billion people living like I do, that's four times as much energy as we supply right now. Now, we don't have to. Not everyone has to have a minivan, uh, which I do. Um, <laughs> so let's imagine, let's imagine the whole world lives like the most efficient, wealthy countries in the world today. That's still more than twice uh, the, the global energy supply. This is a massive challenge. Ignore everything else about climate change, just supplying enough energy, uh, doubling the total energy that we supply, that's a massive challenge. But that's not the only challenge we're facing. Uh, the fundamental physics of the planet are such that as long as we're emitting greenhouse gases, we're going to continue to get global warming and climate change. Uh, this is a bit of a complicated figure, but I'll walk you through it. Uh, if you go uh, to the left on this figure, that's uh, just increasing cumulative greenhouse gas emissions. So just add up all the tons of greenhouse gases we've emitted. That, that's going to the left. Going up is the global temperature. And what you see is this is basically a straight line. This is basically a proportional relationship. What that means is every increment of continued uh, greenhouse gas emissions means we're going to keep getting global warming. The flip side of that is to stabilize the climate system, to, to stabilize global temperature, is going to require reaching net zero. Okay, that is not a political statement. It's not a policy statement. It's a statement about physics. This is a big challenge, because the vast majority of our energy system right now is from fossil fuels. More than 80% of our global energy system is based on fossil fuels. That means uh, greenhouse gas emissions, lots and lots of greenhouse gas emissions. So what will it take? to reach net zero, it's going to require a really rapid deployment at scale of uh, low, zero, and even negative emissions technologies. Now, if we're thinking about the Paris goals, right? so the Paris goals say hold global warming below 2 degrees Celsius above the pre-industrial and pursue 1.5. We're already above 1.1, pushing 1.2. 1.5 is going to require a 7% decrease globally year after year after year. No country's ever done that. The world's never done that. In fact, during COVID, when you might have heard a lot about how much we were reducing emissions, that turned out to be 5.5% decrease in year one. We went back to pre-pandemic levels in year two, and now we're above pre-pandemic levels. And all throughout that, 
CO2 concentrations continued to increase because we were still emitting more than 30 billion tons a year. So what's the big conclusion from all of this? Austerity is not a solution. Okay? Feeling worse and trying harder to stay at home is not going to solve this problem. Okay? It's going to take a massive, rapid deployment of new technologies. And even if we're able to do that fast enough, even if we're able to reach net zero by the middle of this century, we're still going to get more global warming. One and a half degrees is more than one degree. Two degrees is more than one and a half degree. Okay, so we're going to keep getting more climate change. We're going to keep getting more extreme events. And these are already increasing around the world. Many kinds of extremes are already increasing in frequency and intensity. And we're not adapted to it. We're not keeping up. We're being impacted. And I've spent a lot of the last uh, decade or so working on this uh, particular question. So I'm going to show you a few examples from my group's research. First, wildfires in California. We've had major, really large, really destructive wildfires in California in recent years. Uh, we find that the extreme wildfire weather, these weather conditions that are responsible for the largest, most destructive fires, that kind of weather has more than doubled in the last four decades. Similarly, uh, when we analyze extreme precipitation and flooding and the financial costs of flooding, we find that intensifying extreme precipitation events are responsible for about a third of the financial costs of flooding in the US in the last three decades. Think about that. That's billions of dollars a year just in the US. We're already paying out. It's already costing us. If we look globally, we find even larger, even more widespread effects. Uh, in this case, uh, we've asked how much has historical warming affected the per capita GDP in each country around the world. And what we find is that countries like India and Brazil and Nigeria and a whole suite of countries uh, that are already very warm, their economic growth has been dragged down by the warming that's already happened. In fact, those countries, uh, their per capita GDP today is 25 to 30 percent lower than it would have been if global warming hadn't happened. What that means is that global economic inequality has already been exacerbated by uh, global warming and climate change, and we can expect that to intensify in the future. So by now you're thinking it's going to be easy, right? <laughs> uh, right these, are, these are big challenges, uh, but we do have opportunities to solve them if we're able to accelerate solutions. Now, we don't yet know how to do that. Right? We don't know how to do that at the speed and scale that's necessary. Okay? So we need a couple of things. One is we need to better understand how the world works. We actually need to figure out how to create these solutions. But we also need to figure out how to translate them into action. And that's really the, the purpose and the mission of the new Stanford Door School of Sustainability, as you heard earlier. Uh, from President Tessier Levine. This just opened on September 1st. It's super exciting. We've been working really hard to try to figure out what would a world-leading university like Stanford need to do to create a school to solve these challenges. And we really need three things. Uh, first, uh, we need to integrate. We've got so much talent here at Stanford, so many amazing faculty, staff, and students, and we've been working really hard over the last three years to try to bring people together. But we also need to expand. Okay? As, as I've been telling you, these are really big challenges. They're, they're unprecedented in their scope. And we need more expertise uh, to, to figure out uh, what are the solutions and how to scale them. But we can't do it in the ways that we've been doing historically. Right? These, are, these are novel challenges. We need to innovate. We need to figure out uh, the new disciplines, the new ways of thinking uh, that are going to be up to the task. So that's what we've been working on. Uh, it's really exciting. It's really invigorating. It's an amazing time. And that's what gives me hope. So thank you very much.